Welcome to the Backup Wrap-Up, the only podcast dedicated to the underappreciated heroes of the data center, backup admins. We're continuing our coverage of ransomware, and today we're again talking about preventing it. We'll cover a range of preventative measures, including application whitelisting and blacklisting, inventorying service accounts, restricting risky services, and the importance of establishing relationships now with red and blue teams, as well as law enforcement. Let's keep ransomware out of your environment. By the way, if you don't know who I am, I'm W. Curtis Preston, AKA Mr. Backup. And I've been passionate about backup and recovery for over 30 years, ever since I had to tell my boss that there were no backups of the database that we had just lost. I don't want that to happen to me ever again. I don't want it to happen to you. That's why I do this podcast. Here we turn unappreciated backup admins into cyber recovery heroes. This is the Backup Wrap Up. Welcome to the show. Before we get started, I just want to ask you to press the follow or subscribe button so that you can always get this show, whether you're following on an audio format or on YouTube. Uh, either way, we'd love to have you. I'm your host, W. Curtis Preston, a.k.a. Mr. Backup. And with me, I have my non-standard air conditioning installer sympathizer <laughs> persona, Molly Yandi. How's it going, persona? I'm doing well, Curtis. And here's a question. Do you have working air conditioning as of this moment? No. <laughs> <laughs> I do have, it's it's at 95%. Um, I'm doing a very non-standard, I'm installing one of those portable air conditioners, but I'm installing it up on the wall so that, because where I live, you know, I have an HOA and they won't let me put like a window unit air conditioner, right? So I have the, you know, but I don't, I don't have a spot to put it on the floor. So I'm mounting it up on the wall. So it involves <laughs> lots of heavy, like brackets and things like that. And lots of uh, literal sweat equity <laughs> and putting it up. And sadly I put it up and then as you know, uh, had to take it down and put it up again because I neglected to account for the distance between the exhaust port and the window. Oopsies. Yeah, that's not good. Oopsies. Do you, did you also cut a hole for the cord? I did. I cut a hole for the, okay. cut, and, and I cut a very nice hole, very nice hole for the cord. That was the, another mistake in the first version. It's <laughs> uh, what happens when you just sort of winging it, you know, like, oh, I just need a yeah. shelf. I just need a shelf and some brackets. I bought some nice brackets, mm. you know? Might I recommend? Yeah. Because I know it's like above like a bed and things like that that sometimes people sleep in. Yeah. Might I recommend telling people whenever they sleep to put their head on the other side away from the AC unit? <laughs> well, they can sit up. No, no, no. I'm just afraid what? in case something falls. Are you questioning the structural integrity no. of my air conditioning unit? No, but just say that there, we live in California. There might be an earthquake. It might be enough that it shakes off, even though you do have a lip to keep it in place. Yeah. Yeah, I do have a lip to keep it in place. I'm just saying that having a 65 pound or whatever air conditioner fall on your head is probably a lot worse than a 65 pound air conditioner falling on your foot. Uh, yeah, that's probably true. That's probably true. Yeah. So, uh, but thanks for that image. Um, <laughs> so we're going to continue our series in ransomware. Uh, this one is going to be talking about ransomware prevention in terms of other things that we can do. We've already talked about um, the, you know, we've talked about protecting the backup server. We've talked about the, the three things that everyone should do to prevent ransomware. What are those three things, Persona? Patch. Yeah. Patch management. Password management. Password management. And MFA. Exactly. If you're not doing those things, right? I mean, get get some sort of password management system. Um, and yes, please have a patch management system. And please make sure that the backup server is part of that patch management system. And I think it should be in the front of the line for patches. And please. PPM. If you're not using, um, you know, if you're not using MFA at this point, 
uh, you're going to hear it's going to come up again in this episode. But this is in addition to that, in addition to all the stuff that you did to, to you know, this is assuming you did that. What's the next step? These are the please do these things. Um, it will also make it harder for you to be attacked by ransomware. And the, the first and it could make it harder for you to also use things, too. <laughs> what? Well, it's a balance. This, this is true. Right. A yeah. lot of times security is at war with usability. Yep. <laughs> right. Um, and I, I tell the following uh, story, which I know I've told here before, but I remember back when I first, um, you know, did backup software, we used this lovely thing called RSH, right? And all you had to have was, uh, you know, an entry in, uh, I forgot the name of the file. There was a file in the, the you know, the your 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 home directory, which even if it was root, you, if you had that file um, and, and it had the name of the host you were coming from in that file, you could RSH <laughs> as root without a password. And, and I happen to know that one company where I um, installed backup software, one of the many that I did throughout the years, household name company, um, when I got there, they had RSH as root from every Unix host to every other Unix host. Ugh. And this was like a major company. Yeah. Um, why, why do I bring that up? Um, it, it, you know, I, I just remember how much the security people hated that. Right. Yeah. But, and, but going but, to the but, other let me just finish. side, but the reason was that the tool in question was R dump. R dump wouldn't work. If you, RSH. if you couldn't RSH as root without a password. Yeah. Okay. So that's one side. Now let's go to the other extreme, right? Where I think you've told a story on the podcast before <laughs> the one company you worked at where the yeah. network people locked down every single server. Yeah. Yeah. It was the most secure company that I'd ever worked <laughs> at. It was the complete opposite of that other company. And um, where we we were prepping for Y2K and they, they were really it was it was a very secure environment where they did they did all the things that we asked people to do and and you weren't able to get from one server to another server. It's like the question was why do you need to get from server A to server B? Right? Uh you you needed a reason to be able to communicate yep. between those two servers and then they would open up only the port that you needed. And I was the the one crazy guy that, you know, my server needed to talk to all the servers because uh, backup. backup and yeah. <laughs> they didn't like that and they kept trying to shut it down and then and and then they and then they kept trying to like sniff the problem the problem with that backup uh well one of the problems with that backup is that it uses a random series of ports and um so they did not like that and they kept shutting things down and yes uh, it, it just it was uh so let's just say this this thing of security being at war with usability is not, <laughs> it's not a new problem. Yep. Um, and the first thing that I want to talk about, it's just something that I want you to think about because as I recall, the last time you and I talked about it, I think you were against it. Um, and, and, and we'll, we'll see. To a certain um, extent. Yeah. That is this concept of application whitelisting. Uh, and in my notes, I have this as the silver bullet. And why do I say that? And we can argue as to whether or not it's a good silver bullet, but why do I say it's a silver bullet? Because you're basically restricting what runs in the environment. So right. if you control what runs, then there's less likelihood that you will be using something that is malicious. Right. Right. So if we if we say only, you know, Microsoft Word and SQL Server and SharePoint are the only things that are allowed to run on this box, if there's something other than that, malware based, then it just won't be able to run because it's not whitelisted, right? Yeah. It is a giant pain in the butt <laughs> to choose. Can, can we agree that yeah. application whitelisting is a giant pain in the butt? What do you think? Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> yeah. Is it, however, something that we should think about in certain 
circumstances. For example, if you have a very well uh, understood end user community that they all use the same 17 applications, right? Yep. And you could you could lock it down to the same 17 applications for all of those. And then of course you will absolutely have some users who are special. Their name will probably be Curtis or Persona because we always <laughs> want to do stuff that's outside of Different. the norm, right? Um, you, you, you'll have a handful of power users that will end up with 37 other applications. I think that in those scenarios, like we don't, maybe we don't have to do it for, well, th there's just, there are areas where maybe it's harder to do than others. And, and I'm thinking- Organization or functional units. Right, right. Yeah. Um, if there's an area where you can do this, I guess I'm just saying, think about it. Yeah, because if no, you I did application it, whitelisting, I think it would be it would go a long way to stopping ransomware. Or any and I think there's different ways you can implement application whitelisting, right? One way is to sort of say, "Hey, here is a list of approved IT applications that you are allowed to install and deploy, but don't necessarily prevent people from installing other things." You sort of use the honor system or IT policies, just like everyone has, right? You sign a code of conduct when you join right. a company, right? And, or the employee handbook, right? And then could we perhaps monitor for anything yeah. that is outside the whitelist and then send it's, off the, the clacks and alerts when it... Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? So you can at least start a process. So you're not getting in the way, but at least you're having an ability to monitor and figure out, okay, what are people doing? Does this make sense? And maybe you also have a list of applications because... I think in addition to having a list of applications that you approve in that whitelist, it's also important to have a list of applications that you block. Yeah. Right. Which is also as equally as important. And right? what would what would the name of that process be? Application blacklist. Yes. Okay. You, you said that. Like it, you weren't sure. Yes, it's the opposite of a whitelist, right? Application yeah. blacklist, right? So you could you could have a, a series of apps. Um and and I would put a lot of the security software that is often installed by um, uh, cyber attackers as um, bl blacklisted. Again, there are exceptions to the blacklist where you need to install it, and then you want to find out who who is actually trying to install such such tools, yeah. right? Yeah, um, and. And I think another thing, Curtis, that becomes interesting is these days, a lot of people just use SaaS applications. So by using a SaaS application, you don't even have to worry mm -hmm. about application whitelisting as much anymore, right? Isn't SaaS so great? <laughs> <laughs> there are things I don't like. As you know, there are things I don't like about the SaaS world. I'm concerned very much about all the data that's out there. But um, but this is definitely a, an advantage of the SaaS. Uh, you know, we're I mean, as we are talking, we are using a SaaS application. Mm -hmm. I don't know how we would do this back in the day, would, right? I guess we could. What what was that tool that we used to OB, OBC? OBS. 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 We we used to use OBS, um, and theoretically, we could do that but we would still need a way to see each other yeah. um which, we'd have facetime running in parallel which would be a SaaS <laughs> yeah yeah um there you know what i remember back in the very early back day, in the days i remember software that you used on your laptop. You had a piece of software running on your laptop, they had a piece of software running on their laptop, and those two pieces of software directly communicated um, to, to webcam to each other. Yeah. Man, those were such, so, <laughs> so bad at their Painful. quality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that the, the SaaS world makes things a lot easier. Um, all right, so enough of that. So now let's talk about disabling other attack vectors. Now, one of the things that came up when um, we had Dwayne on with the the, the Red Team uh, episode, which at this point is now about five or six episodes back, is this idea that there are service accounts out there that are running with like no, no password, default passwords, or really default. crappy passwords, right? 
what's a, what's a service account? Why does this matter? So a service account is like a special privileged account that runs on the system and is used for things that need to happen without necessarily user interaction. As an example, backup. Right. right? So normally you have a backup service account that runs on the system and kicks off backups that need to happen on the system. Do you remember the special thing he said about the backup service account? That it had access to everything. It had access to everything without logging. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So it can access all the files that it wants, download all the files it wants, because that's what backup is, right? Override all the files it wants, because that's what restore is, without triggering any alarms of any kind. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. And here you have it installed with the password of backup. <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe it's installed with net backup or net, networker yeah. or TSM. Um <laughs> yeah, or Veeam, right? Uh please, yeah. please don't do that. <laughs> right. So so I want to talk about so we need to figure out how many service accounts are out there. And so there is this uh, there is this concept of a service account inventory, um, and when I when I googled that, there you know there the, there were some uh, some things that you could do. Obviously, they talked about things like reviewing the documentation, uh, you know, any documentation you have as to where you would typically install service accounts. Uh, there are Active Directory tools such as uh, you know PowerShell that you can look for things like. Uh, special account flags uh, and two special account flags pop up. Do you know what they are? I'm going to guess no. Duh. Why no. would you know this, <laughs> right? The two special account flags that they popped up are don't expire password or password not required. Ugh. Password not required. Um, you know, look for group membership, like domain admins, enterprise admins, um, you know, and look for but, the types of applications that need service accounts. What but, kinds but, of applications besides backup would you think those are? Anything that runs as like a daemon process, right? In right. the background on the system. Right. So um, your security software. Right. Security software. Ironically enough, you use the service <laughs> antivirus. Antivirus, right? Um, the but, um, uh, go ahead. But a thing though, a service account you cannot normally you're not allowed to log in using a service account. Right, right. It is just for things that are already on the system to be able to operate with different privileges on the system. Right. You can't log in like in the traditional sense, yeah. but you can log in from an API perspective and do the things yeah. that that thing is supposed to do. And so all I'm saying is figure out what those are and give them real passwords. If you've got accounts, service accounts that say, don't, you know, no password required. <laughs> it seems like that is bad. And I think the other thing to mention is the service accounts are basically on a per machine basis. Yes. Right. So it's not like you can go look in Active Directory mm -hmm. and say, hey, where, what are all my service accounts? You have to hit every single box and say, what are the service accounts available? And that's why you use things like PowerShell and other things to make sure, okay, what is there? And this inventory shouldn't be on a one-time basis either because right. applications get added, removed, systems come online, get decommissioned. Yeah, a very regular thing. You should be out there looking for new service accounts. So I'm hearing that the most common way that systems are compromised these days is um, stolen credentials. What's the second uh, most common way? <laughs> well, what was that? <laughs> for those not watching the video version on YouTube, uh, Persona just made a... a I think that was, was that like a fishing reel? Uh, yeah, it's a fishing reel and then uh, pull it back in. <laughs> um, fishing. <laughs> yeah, fishing with a PH. Uh, fishing <laughs> and uh, and spear fishing, which is a very specific type of fishing. The And this is 
often via um, email, right? Yeah. And so another thing I'd like you to consider is, again, these are all optional things, um, you know, some less optional, I think, than others. Mm -hmm. But this is something to consider, and that is the idea of putting in some type of monitoring system, filtering system in your email system in order to uh, see if you can catch, you know, use AI um, and, and other tools to identify phishing uh, attacks yeah. on the front end. And, and I believe that many of the SaaS email providers like Microsoft and Google have pretty extensive phishing protections already built in, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't use a third party solution as well. I think that's true everywhere, right? That there's often yeah. OS tools that are available, but there are, um, third party tools that may be more extensive, the question, they will also be more expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> extensive and expensive. Um, all right. So we got to talk about my favorite boogeyman. What, what is it? Port 3922, I think. Is that? <laughs> or is it 3553? Is that the port for RDP? The ransomware deployment protocol? Um, yeah. 3389. There we go. Three, three, eight, nine. Three, three, I think you should get that tattooed on your forehead. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm suddenly I'm thinking about um, two, four, six, zero, oh, one from um, Les Mis. Yeah. Um, so please shut off RDP at, at a bare minimum. Restrict RDP so that it, you know so that the RDP port is only accessible via a particular network. And that network should only be accessible via a VPN, which is only accessible via MFA. We're going to get back to that in a minute. You know, restrict SMB as much as you can. Um, I'm sorry, restrict RDP. RDP as much as you can. Uh, and then also, you know, I threw out SMB. Let me just throw that out. Um, Windows <laughs> has a default administrative share. What's up with that? Right? Is it admin dollar? Yeah. Um, <laughs> That's what it is. And, and and you can access the entire uh, C drive, right? Um, turn that sucker off. Why, why is it there? Um, you know, why is it there? Why is it on by default? Uh, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, if you've got, by the way, if, if you disagree with me, uh, feel free to do so in the comments. I would love to hear uh, why the default administrative share is not just fundamentally evil like RDP. Um, but this is an SMB share that is on by default in Windows Server uh, and win Windows Desktop. Is, is it is it in Windows Desktop though? Yes, because I've used it. Okay, because so I was recently setting up my mom's new laptop, Windows mm -hmm. 11. Mm -hmm. And when I went, because I was copying data over and I went to go access it via another laptop and it basically said sharing is disabled. Network sharing. It's a good question, right? Um, I'm not a Windows person. Uh, Neither am I. It took me a while, and I wanted to pull out my hair. Yeah, but but um, the um, you should tell your mom to upgrade to a real computer. Um, <laughs> she likes her Windows laptops. I'm not going to argue with her. Uh, yeah, uh, I know a lot of people like Windows. I just you know I close Windows whenever I can. Anyway. Um, so the next thing uh, let's talk about, and I, I alluded to it already, and that is if your normal workday process requires a VPN, what do you think about having an MFA on that VPN? Oh, you definitely should. Yeah. This is, but, but he of, of everything on this list, if you're allowing computers outside your company to access your company resources and you're not using a VPN and you're not using MFA for that VPN, I, you know, this, I, but I don't know what to say. Save the question for you. Okay. Is it still technically considered MFA if you have an OTP in order to be able to log in to your I VPN? Think, yeah, I think the, the OTP, um, you know, uh, I think that, well, assuming that OTP 
has uh, MFA built into it, right? Um, or if it's like an RSA token, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I'm assuming, I, I'd assume that if you're using Okta or something like that, that you're going to enforce MFA, MFA on your entire yeah. environment. If you do, I'm, I'm good. I'm just saying if you're remotely letting people access stuff inside your computing environment and you're not using MFA, I, you know, yeah, that's like you're asking <laughs> for it kind of thing, right? Especially going back to what you previously said about credential stuffing yeah. being a common issue. Exactly, right? Why is that, by the way? What, what do you mean by that statement you just made? Because if you don't have MFA, then someone might compromise credentials somewhere else and say a user happens to reuse their passwords. Now they have access to your environment because they're able to connect by VPN without requiring MFA. There you go. But I want to add one thing to this. Yeah. Even with MFA, train your users not to get hit by MFA fatigue. Yeah. Right. We've seen so many attacks where the attacker bombards the system with MFA requests and then the user is like, fine, fine, I give up. I don't know what's going on. And yeah. they're like, okay, it's me. <laughs> yeah. Th this goes back to the stuff that we talked about last week about training the people that work in your environment, yeah. right? Um, let them know what MFA, you know, an MFA fatigue attack is and yeah. to watch for it and to not respond to it the way that you just described. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Just leave me alone. Yeah. You know, I think that's what happened with the Okta attack, right? Yeah. It happened yeah. many, many months ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, here's another one that, that the, the, the link that you shared me, I think it is fascinating. Um, the next thing I have on the list is reputable antivirus or anti-malware software. Uh, what, what did that article talk about? Yeah, so this was an article which happened to be published the day we're recording this, um, and it was from the Register, uh, and it basically said that more than half the people, even though antivirus tools are available in the operating system, they mm -hmm. still install third-party antivirus solutions. Yeah. And one of the things that I found at the very bottom of this article, which I thought was interesting is they said malware writers, the first thing that they do is they'll probably go and test against the standard tools. Right. Right. And by having a third party, you're now adding an additional layer of defense to protect you against being attacked and being uh, infected by these malware. Yeah. You know, those tools are, they're just like any of these tools. Nothing is um, perfect. What's that? Nothing is perfect. Yeah. But... Nothing is perfect. But, um, you know, I, you know, maybe I'm an old schooler here and I, I believe in the concept of these third party tools. Well, there um, is another stat, which I will call out. Yeah. Which said that oh. uh, when they looked at the like statistics. The stat. I don't like this stat. <laughs> when they looked at the statistics, they found that twice the number of people had third party software for if they were in the age group of 65 and above versus in the age group of 45 and below to that i just want to say bleep <laughs> uh whatever um all right the the final but antivirus is important though, yeah right? antivirus is important yeah antivirus anti-malware um yeah. the um um the next group of things that I want to talk about are, again, this isn't so much preventing, um, you know, preventing an attack as much as it is, you know, pre preparing for one. Well, no, yeah, yeah I guess this is, it's also, preventing. This is all pre also preventing. Never mind. Yeah. The, the next group of things are, are a little bit different. And that is this idea of proactively going and doing things to see to see what you can see, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and the first is this concept of an automated pen test. What is that? So a pen test is a penetration test mm -hmm. where you can hire a company, you can procure software where it will basically test your network, your systems to see, are there any common vulnerabilities? Are ports closed? Do you have RDP exposed to the internet? Things like that to help you understand, okay, where are the gaps in my systems today? Right. And, and they range, 
um, everywhere from like uh, twenty nine ninety nine. You know, uh, <laughs> we'll do a pen test of your company. And I don't mean to imply that there's no value there, but there's definitely less value there than the, the, the next option. And that is this concept of a red team. Again, we had Dwayne LaFlotte on here from Pulsar Security. They are a red team, right? It's a fascinating episode, by the way. If you didn't, if you didn't mm-hmm. take a look at that, uh, it was about, I don't know, six weeks or so ago at this point. The idea, this is, for those of you that have seen the movie Sneakers, this is the guys in the movie Sneakers. Those of you that haven't seen the movie Sneakers, go watch the movie go Sneakers. Go watch it. Yeah. It's It ages actually pretty well. There's some stuff in there, just like any movie that centers around computers. There's some stuff in there that's complete BS. You're not, but, you know. Um, you're, you're not going to recommend Hackers or The Net no, or Swordfish? I'm not going to recommend <laughs> Hackers or The Net or Swordfish. Um, the net that oh man, can't even. You remember it was about hitting the escape button. You remember how the escape button was like the uh, Sandra Bullock, right? Well, that's yep. Sandra Bullock. Yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly enough, that when you when you when you bring up those three movies, the only thing I remember are the pretty girls that were in those three movies. I don't, and the fact that the computer stuff was was crap, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, somehow I got distracted. What were we talking red about? Team. Red team. We're talking about red teams, right? So this is a professional team whose job it is to infiltrate your environment at your request. And this think is like the hackers or stuff, right? Yeah. They're think like the hackers, right? They are almost ethical hackers. If you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember Dwayne said that they kind of backed away from that term that they use. They use, um, I forgot what the term that they use instead, but White basically, hat. yeah, yeah, that, that, that there, there's like a more all inclusive term that they now use. But the, um, you know, this is a company that you hire that is going to do all sorts of things to try to break into your environment. And, um, I remember one of his stories was about they hacked this company via a TV that was in the lobby, right? Yep. And they did it by going and getting, they got, they figured out what the TV was. They figured out the brand of the TV and then they went and got that TV and they tore it apart. And, you know, um, this is hard. And found an insecure Wi-Fi chip in it that had an exploit and. Yeah. Um, and, uh, this involves, this involves things like, uh, it could be, there's also physical, uh, penetration tests, right? So, you know, I remember, um, uh, listening to Kevin Mitnick, which I know not everybody, uh, likes or appreciates Kevin Mitnick, but, uh, I, I did learn a lot from his talk and it was, uh, this, it it was about him, um, basically, going into a building it was like a it was like a commercial building and he went into the bathroom and he just waited in the bathroom for some other person to come mm. and he used his badge scanner which works up to like six feet away or something and he's sitting in a bathroom skull waiting <laughs> for some other guy to go and then he's scanning the guy's badge and then he uses that badge to get into the building right this is the, you know this is some yeah. some, some hardcore <laughs> stuff are all it's like something out of Hollywood. Yeah, it is like something out of Hollywood. But, th- you know, these are people that this is what they do and um, they enjoy it. They're good at it. And you should definitely look into the concept of a red team. Now, what about a blue team? They're the ones who are trying to protect your environment. Right. From potential attackers. Right. And so they're like the defense. Right. Yeah, they are the defense. And they're also the ones that you would bring in when you have a cyber attack, right? Yep. Um, and so one of the things that I talk a lot about is that you need to establish that. Um, and again, another one of the another one of the experts that we've had on here that uh, is from a blue team is Mike Saylor from Black Swan Security, and we're gonna have we're gonna have him on some more. 
and he uh, he talks a lot about he's been in many of these attacks and he completely agrees with me. Of course he does, because this is what he does, that now is the time to form a relationship with the blue team. Why would if if there's somebody that I would call in in the time of a cyber attack, why would I want to get a relationship with them now? Because a cyber attack attack is very stressful and you'd rather have that relationship pre-built so you understand what's expected, what each person is going to do, the roles and responsibilities, such that when you do have that cyber attack, everyone can just be like, okay, let's go, 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 go. Everyone knows what they need to do. Yeah, you know, uh, the analogy that I'm going to use is going to be kind of funny. And, and I know you know the story, but it has nothing to do with cyber attack. Like the time, the time to get a relationship with somebody like this is before you need them. Right. And I'm thinking about the time that I cut into the main supply line of my house, uh, the water, the water, the, the water main for my house. And, uh, I, I, this was when I was replacing my front yard. I have a 400 square foot front yard, right? It's very, you know, it's California. So my yard is not that big. And, uh, I was digging it up to put down, um, you know, the, I was going to put down artificial turf. And it's kind of funny that when you put our artificial turf, the first thing you have to do is you have to dig up the yard and you have to, you dig down like six inches and then you put paver uh, a base there. So you basically yeah. pave your yard. And then on top of that, you put an inch of sand. And then on top of that, you put the grass. Now, I was digging and I knew where my water main was. And the really funny thing is, was I don't want to damage my water main while I'm doing this, but I'm not a hundred percent sure what a water main is. So I'm just going to dig yeah. around my water main to find my water main, to make sure I don't hit my water main. And the process, and then you hit the process of doing that, I hit my water main. Now, what does this have to do with this? The point was that I knew exactly where to go because there was, there's a guy that lives that way, like, 300 yards from my house and i went right to that guy's house and i was like um you know i just did this thing <laughs> luckily luckily i will say it was on the on the Outside. other side of the valve that the, the yeah. water department supplies because if i had broken it on their side then that would have been a, a whole thing right yeah but uh it was i remember it was like a sunday and and by the way, cyber attacks never come when it's convenient. They do it on purpose, yep. right? They they there there will be a bunch of cyber attacks uh, oh, tomorrow. Yep. Right? Uh, we're in the U.S. tomorrow. The the day we're recording this tomorrow is July fourth, and there will be a bunch of uh, a lot of people have a four day weekend because yep. um, you know I think I think it should be a federal law that July fourth can't fall on a Thursday, but it is. <laughs> It's on a Thursday tomorrow. So a lot of people will just take Friday off. So they have a four day weekend. This is when cyber attacks happen. Right. So it was yep. a Sunday afternoon. And luckily I had, I had already established a relationship with this plumber guy and I went over and I just knocked on his door and I'm like, I realize it's five o'clock on a Sunday mm. and you're clearly having dinner with your family, <laughs> but I just blew up my house. <laughs> so <laughs> Could you help me, please? If there's anything you could do, that would be awesome. And he came over and uh, repaired my water main. You know, had to we had to dig a big hole, a much bigger hole, to get access to the pipe. Yeah. And um, you know, and he repaired it. And then uh, he said, uh, "I was like, how much do I owe you?" I was prepared for five hundred bucks, you know, or more. Yeah. And he said one hundred fifty bucks because he did it like nice. off the clock and you know his own yeah. thing and i was like dude you know where where do i sign right you're like thank you for saving me yeah Did you know calling a plumber for an emergency repair on a sunday after in the evening I was gonna they're out at me. least 400 bucks before they even do anything yeah and so this is what i'm saying is like just get a relationship now get a relationship now with your local fbi department uh, by the way, Mike talked about that a lot. Infraguard, yeah. Infraguard was the yeah. name of the IBM. I'm sorry, the IRS. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the Not FBI the program meant to uh, help 
uh, people combat cybercrime and, yeah. um, you know, look at InfraGuard, get a relationship with the FBI, get a, and or whatever it is where you happen to live. And um, but now's the time to do that. Any further thoughts on that? No, I think, yeah, having those pre-established relationships helps, especially as these blue teams, red teams, right? They're probably keeping up to date on the latest of what's happening out there. So yeah, they're also a great resource for that too. Yeah. You want to, you want to have them on speed dial, right? Like yeah. <laughs> you get the thing, you make the call, they're on their way. Not, not, yeah. you know, I'm having a Google do I blue, look up? blue teams yeah. for cyber defense. <laughs> Uh, who do I call when I have a ransomware attack? Um, that's not the time to be doing that. It's already Ghostbusters. What's that? You said, who are you going to call when you have a ransomware attack? Oh, and I say, Ghostbusters. That, that's an old joke, man. You know, you're dating yourself. Um, that's a good movie, though. Um, ruined by later attempts at... <laughs> sequels but we whatever. shall not go there we shall not go, we shall there, not go there all right good movie all right well this has been a good episode further things that you can do to prevent ransomware and to prepare yourself to be able to defend ransomware if and when it happens although it's more a win than an f uh any final thoughts persona no uh, this was a great conversation i'm dying in the heat out here uh we're in our middle of our heat wave so what what's temperature outside right now i think it's 103 uh, and what's the temperature inside? Uh, about 84. I really should turn on the air conditioner. <laughs> um, so you you want to know what the temperature is outside where I am right now? 75. 75? <laughs> exactly yeah. what it is. That is San Diego versus the Bay Area. Um, yep. You know, in a nutshell. <laughs> um yeah, just different parts of the Bay Area, right? Because certain yeah. parts of the Bay Area can be quite cold. Actually. Well, I was looking at the thing. They said up in San Francisco, it's in the 60s, like low 60s. Yeah. And if you go to the East Bay, uh, Livermore, Pleasant in that area, it's, I think, 108 degrees. Wow. Coldest winter I ever spent was a summer in San Francisco. <laughs> Mark Twain. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, Prasanna. Thank you to the listeners. Uh, I hope you're getting something out of this. And remember to hit that subscribe or follow button so that you can um, you can get us every time. And um, that is a wrap. The Backup Wrap-Up is written, recorded, and produced by me, W. Curtis Preston. If you need backup or DR consulting, content generation, or expert witness work, check out BackupCentral.com. You can also find links for my O'Reilly books on the same website. Remember, this is an independent podcast, and any opinions that you hear are those of the speaker and not necessarily an employer. Thanks for listening.